What's up, everybody? It's Friday. It's Friday. Friday. Everybody should be excited because the weekend is just around the corner. It's been a great week. It's been a busy one. I'm a little almost like sweaty today. Been running around like crazy. Got fingerprinted because I'm helping coach my old high school's pickleball team, if you can believe that. It's like a it's like a club sport, um, and I'm going to be helping out with that. And in order to do that, you have to like take test, background check, fingerprint, all that stuff. Tons of case stuff going on. We resolved a couple good ones this week, which was always interesting. We've got one continued that was supposed to go to trial. It's just been a really busy week and culminating with a busy Friday. But I'm pumped to be hanging out with you guys, talking Brian Koberger. These documents that have been filed are interesting. They give us an idea as to why this case had to be continued. Um, the We're going to read the speedy trial waiver so you guys can see what the actual language of that is and why a waiver like this, a knowing and intelligent waiver with the colloquy of questions the judge asked in the hearing in combination with this written document, why it eliminates just about every possible appellate issue surrounding delay and speedy trial in the case. Now, not to uh, mean they're not going to still try to strike the death penalty. Okay. So that's important to keep that in mind because we know that we're also going to look at this motion to dismiss and the, the sealed nature of it and what's sealed and what could potentially be in there. And then we're also going to just very quickly talk about the defense's response or reply to the state's um, objection to their motion to dismiss. And this is again, taking us back to the legal standard and burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt versus probable cause in the grand jury um, indictment process. So that's what's on the agenda for today. If you're here for that and you like that, then like this video for me. All right, let's just keep, keep liking videos, spreading good vibes only. What an easy way to spread good vibes. Subscribe to the page if you haven't already. We're growing towards 300K every time. We hit a milestone. It blows my mind because I never, ever expected this. I never expected to help so many different clients that found us through YouTube, which is wild as well to think in today's day and age, you can find your lawyer and find clients that you know you have life-changing experiences with literally um, and be there during some of the toughest times for people and try to help work their way out of them and get them justice and get them back on their feet and get them made as whole as they possibly could be. It's just, it's wild. And it's an awesome thing to be reminded of as we come and hang on this stream together. I am really fortunate and just pumped to be able to do that and have that be part of my life and have this be part of my life and you all be part of my life. All right, let's get into the defense's reply here first. And I'm going to kind of go through this one quick as to not bore you. We read that entire thing together. We know what the defense's argument is. I just want to kind of highlight their two main points here of this reply to the state's objection. And again, this has to do with the probable cause versus beyond a reasonable doubt. This one to me has been a pretty simple legal standard that I think the judge is going to only take a few seconds to figure out um, why the defense is just wrong about this. Um, the probable cause standard in the grand jury indictment is something that's been in there forever. I don't expect that to change. Um, and I don't expect the judge to really think twice about it. So, the defense, after the state objected and said, it's basically how we've always done it. This is what the Supreme Court says. This is what the statute says. The defense basically has two major arguments. Number one, there is no Idaho Supreme Court authority binding on this court as to the standard of proof for a grand jury. And again, they basically argue semantics. Then section two, I said two arguments. I think there's four. Um, there's only two that I think are even somewhat legitimate. Number two, uh, section 191107 sets the standard of proof for grand juries at beyond a reasonable doubt. This is literally the same exact argument they made before. If the judge wants to see it this way, this is how they would win. I find it very, very unlikely. Argument number three, these two rules conflict and the rule does not, sorry, the, the code and the rule conflict and the rule does not control because it is a substantive right. Again, at nauseum, 
we read through this and the other motion. I don't think this is going to be controlling, but if it was, sections two and three is how they actually have a chance to convince the judge, which would overturn and cause such a crazy ripple effect. I can't even let my brain go there. I feel like I'd be in the spider verse. And then lastly, which is another one that I just think is interesting that the defense points this out. Mr. Koberger asserts a theory the law allows and seeks a remedy the court can grant. It's like you do actually have discretion to do this, judge. Anytime you've got to convince the judge that they do have discretion to do something, it's probably not the st strongest argument. And then the last one, I was wrong, there's five, is just categorically wrong. The state also appeals to its decision three, sorry, appends to its decision three district court opinions claiming they are persuasive authority. Certainly all these respectable jurists, meaning judges, may have attempted to tackle these issues, but they did not have the benefit of Mr. Koberger's briefing and research. It's like they didn't get to read all of the great work we did, Judge. And those district court opinions are not persuasive, they say. Well, again, I think that is just wrong. There is binding authority, which the Supreme Court would be, where this court would have to do it. That's why they say the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on this, Judge, because if the Supreme Court did, you have to follow the Supreme Court. That's binding. Persuasive is simply a secondary source like another judge that the court may follow but does not have to follow. And that is exactly by definition what these three district court opinions are. They are persuasive. The judge should read them and may follow them, but does not have to. He can disagree with these district court opinions. But the fact that they say they're not even persuasive, I, I don't even understand. I don't even get it. I don't get legally what they're trying to say. So what are they? So that means they're either binding or they're worthless if they're not even persuasive. So again, I don't think there's a ton of value in that document, but some of you asked me questions about it, so I wanted to read through it with you and just kind of give you the over-the-top view. We already read that entire document together. And those of you who are champions of this channel stuck through the entire thing with me. All right, next, let's look at the speedy trial waiver felony. And the language is what I want to focus on. We know he signed it. We heard him verbally say he wants to waive the speedy trial. Nobody's forcing him to. Absolutely, he wants to do this, okay? So let's read just in case. Now, now again, having it filmed and recorded is actually a benefit if there are appellate issues because we know exactly what he said. Now, you can always get it transcribed and get the court reporter. But the way he looked and if he said, oh, well, that's what the court reporter... I mean, I can't tell you how many people have said that something that was written down did not happen the way it sounds. You know, you can get wrong context and text messages or emails. That can happen. And the same thing has been argued in court documents, in transcripts. No, that's not how I said it. That's not what I meant. So video can actually add context to all of these documents and everything that happens throughout the case. All right, so let's read through this in black and white. Brian Koberger signed it and Taylor signed it. The defendant acknowledges that the defendant has a right to have this case brought to a trial within six months of defendant's arraignment in district court on an indictment or within six months of the filing of the information. And this is just a generic form that they have them sign once they go through the colloquy. Further, the defendant acknowledges consulting with defendant's attorney regarding the right to a speedy trial pursuant to the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 13 of the Idaho Constitution and Idaho Code, Section 193501. Now, What's just interesting and behind the curtain is as we read through these things and you think, gosh, they list a lot of things out. Well, for the most part, if you have boilerplate language that lists out a bunch of different things, it's because in the past, lawyers have made arguments that certain things disqualified this waiver or made it faulty or incomplete or unknowing or unintelligent. What do I mean by that? The defendant acknowledges, this is still paragraph one. I'm rereading the second half. The defendant acknowledges consulting with defendant's attorney because in the past, there have been arguments made that, well, the defendant didn't even get to consult with his attorney before doing this. And there were times when the uh, attorney for defendant signature wasn't on this document. 
Then, regarding, what did he get to consult with his attorney with? His right to a speedy trial for the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Okay. But wait, judge. And I'm not saying these were all successful arguments, just arguments that lawyers make. But judge, nobody advised him of his right under the Idaho Constitution. Okay, let's add that in there too. He's been advised Article 1, Section 13 of the Idaho Constitution. But judge, nobody advised him of his right of the Idaho Code, where in the actual rules, it states a speedy trial. Okay, let's add that in there too. They have discussed all of these parts and he knows what he is waiving. And it's not just the United States Constitution, but also the Idaho Constitution and Idaho Codes. And now with that context, let's read paragraph two. It's just interesting to think about that. It's like, we want to make sure all of our I's are dotted and T's are crossed in everything that we do. Based upon careful consideration and consultation with the attorney, the defendant waives the defendant's speedy or right to speedy trial. The defendant fully understands the advantages and disadvantages of waiving the right to a speedy trial and believes that it would be in defendant's best interest to give up this right. So another important factor, there are benefits, there are advantages and disadvantages to demanding speedy trial and waiving. So in order to waive in writing, he's saying, he believes the advantages of waiving speedy trial outweigh the disadvantages. And the disadvantage of demanding speedy trial is outweighing the advantages. All important factors here as to why he's making that decision and not being coerced or forced or tricked into making this decision. The defendant further understands that once the right to a speedy trial is waived, the court may set this case for trial more than six months from the time in which the defendant was arraigned in district court on an indictment or from the filing of the information. So in court, the judge did a really good job of saying, we may have to continue this case in the future. That may be necessary. And if we do, you need to realize that you're waiving your right to say, no, you can't do that because I'm demanding a speedy trial right now. And they put it here in writing a little more vague, but that this trial does not have to go within six months. And he needs to understand that. And hopefully does understand that. All right, let's answer a few questions here before we get to the motion to dismiss. First, we've got twitchy, witchy, true crime. Wafa Jones. Miranda Campbell has new members here. M. Lebrecht, Peter, did you get my email from 8-4? I am not sure if I did. Need a little more context than that, probably. 40 Daughtry. If BK hadn't waived speedy trial, could the prosecution have dropped charges and reset, sorry, refiled them to reset them six months, to reset the six-month period? Is that a loophole? No. That is actually specific, a great question. And again, probably because it happened is why the rule specifically states a prosecution cannot circumvent the speedy trial rule by dismissing charges and then refiling those same charges to reset the clock. Great question. And it's been thought of before. Channeling the heart, Barbara Joyce, honorary PhD for BK. A lot of people are saying they think he's driving a lot of this, not his lawyers. Be really interesting if, if a criminal defendant with a public defender could convince them to do this kind of research and go way back into history, writing these 70 page documents, trying to convince the court that we've been applying the wrong standard to grand juries for forever. Peter, do you think he should have waited a bit longer to waive speedy trial? I don't think, I don't know if I would say he should have, I would say I probably would have, I would have at least tried to wait until I forced the state to give me all the discovery that they already have because the deadline was coming up. But I don't think there was anything wrong with waiving it when he did if they knew that that was going to be the inevitable end of this as well. Steph C, would the Idaho Supreme Court ever take up clearing up or tightening up the grand jury beyond a reasonable doubt ass assertion? Would it require a case or can they take it up on their own? So it would probably require a case. The Idaho Supreme Court cannot write law. The Idaho legislature could look at this and say, we need to make this clear. Let's make a ruler statute that specifically states it out and disclaims this whole argument of beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but I think it's possible. Welcome, Jennifer. 
And thank you, Annie K and LC for these super chats. All right. Let's get into this motion to dismiss, which is rather interesting. All right, motion to dismiss. Indictment on grounds of biased grand jury, inadmissible evidence, lack of sufficient evidence, and prosecutorial misconduct in withholding exculpatory evidence. Now let's dig in here. Comes now, Brian C. Koberger, through his attorneys of record and files a motion to dismiss indictment on grounds of a biased grand jury, inadmissible evidence, lack of sufficient evidence, and prosecutorial misconduct by withholding exculpatory evidence. The motion is based on the state's various violations during the grand jury pursuant to Idaho code, all of these different codes, Mr. Koberger raises 24 issues, which are set forth in full in the memorandum in support of the motion to dismiss the indictment and its attachments. So let's take a look here at the next document, which is the defendant's motion to file memorandum in support of the motion to dismiss indictment under seal. So all the documents supporting their 24 issues, they want to file under seal. We don't really find out why. They just moved the court for an order to file the memorandum under seal. They didn't say to protect anybody's name, to protect the grand jurors potential witnesses, maybe that's just supposed to be understood because they cite the rule here. But they want to file the entire memorandum in support of this motion to dismiss under seal. Now, they didn't do that when it came to the last motion to dismiss based on this you know, argument about probable cause versus beyond a reasonable doubt. And then... Almost immediately, as has happened throughout the entirety of this case, Judge Judge signs an order to file the memorandum in support of the motion to dismiss indictment under seal. This court having before it the defendant's motion to file a memorandum in support of motion to dismiss under seal and good cause appearing. Now, therefore, orders that the memorandum in support of the motion to dismiss the indictment on grounds of biased grand jury, inadmissible evidence, lack of sufficient evidence, and prosecutorial misconduct in withholding exculpatory evidence, shall be filed under seal. We don't know why. We don't know what the justification is. We don't know who they're trying to protect as far as identity or things like that, but we can assume it is something like that. So now that we know it's under seal, I'm going to answer a few questions before we go back to this document, which was the motion to dismiss, and we discuss what possible factors would fit into these categories and what it usually means when you have 24 different issues that you're filing a motion to dismiss on. Susan Steele, thank you for the super sticker. Natasha, what would it take for the state to change the amount of time for a speedy trial? Is that likely to ever happen? It's very uniform and similar from state to state. It's not exactly the same. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know the answer to this. I think enough lawyers around the world would have to be convinced and talk to, I mean, you guys have, a lot of states have elected legislature, uh, let it, legislators that write these laws. We have um, bar associations like the Florida Bar that writes laws and edits laws. So it is possible if we found that it was necessary, but I really don't think that there's a lot of a groundswell or push for that. Like I haven't heard a lot of talk about that in the criminal defense circles or in the criminal law circles. My dad is, you know, been on every board and president of every organization. And there really hasn't been a lot of push for that. But next time he's on, we should have, he's going to Alaska on vacation, him and my mom. So they're going to have a great time. But when he comes back and when he comes on again, let's ask him what he thinks about this and if he thinks it'll ever change. 
Does pickleball require a real pickle? No, it does not. Shockingly enough. I will tell you, even if you're not into pickleball, but you like making fun of it, the Instagram reels and memes making fun of pickleball are top notch, top notch. LR, will we ever see what those documents are once this goes to a hearing or will it always stay sealed? Well, I'd be able to answer that better LR if I knew what the reason was for sealing it, right? If they say something about timing or something about poisoning the jury pool or something about witness identity or grand juror identity, some of that stuff's never going to get unsealed, but others could get unsealed maybe after the trial, uh, after the trial starts even, um, at different periods, depending on who it is, maybe when their witness list is revealed and these witness names become public, then it can get unsealed, but it's hard to tell based on the limited information we have. M. Liebrich, uh, it's about an RN license suspension. So that's not ringing a bell. I don't handle that specifically. Um, I've never done any license suspension work. I could try to find somebody maybe that does it, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know a ton of lawyers that handle, um, nursing license suspension or any kind of, I guess, admin law like that. Twitchy witchy question for those of you saying you'd never waive speedy trial if innocent because you wouldn't want to sit in jail forever. Would you chance death penalty or life in prison if your lawyer wasn't ready? So I have not completely seen the chat, but that is categorically false. I would say, I mean, a, a much higher percentage of innocent people or people where the trials end up because, uh, getting a not guilty verdict a much higher percentage of them waive speedy trial than don't waive speedy trial. I will also tell you, a vast majority of private lawyers waive speedy trial almost immediately. And a lot of those cases end up in not guilty verdicts. I don't want to say all of those people are innocent. We know how that works. Not guilty includes innocent and not proven cases. But that's not, that is not a factor in guilt or innocence, whether or not you waive speedy trial. It really is not. I'd almost the opposite could be true, right? If you know you did it, but you don't think they can prove it if you push them and you hurry them up to trial, then you demand speedy trial. But I wouldn't say that either. I wouldn't say that if you demand speedy trial, that means you're guilty. That means you did it. I just know that in the field, when they discuss strategy, that is a strategy that is discussed. Uh, D drug 24 issues. It's either the worst indictment ever or the defense is pushing every little possible problem. So let's take that question first. 24 different issues. We talk about this mostly when we discuss appeals and how you want to focus on your best issues and highlight the major issues to the court. Because if you say you have all these issues, is the court just going to say you're nitpicking kind of like you said here? And is just going to kind of disregard all of them because, you know, 20 of the 24 are weak and is that going to make his eyes glaze over and he's just going to go over the important issues? He shouldn't, obviously, and I don't think he would, but you run that risk. That's why usually you pick the best issues and usually the most, like when you have a bunch of issues, that usually means it's more watered down rather than truly horrible. Although I think your question is perfect. It is one or the other. And maybe it really is just the worst grand jury proceedings of all time. That's possible. Debbie W, personally, I think part of why it's sealed is to keep the evidence from getting out before trial. Well, could be true. At least a percentage of it is in the probable cause affidavit. Rebecca, there are union groups in your state that can help you with RN license suspension. There you go. It's an answer that I couldn't even give because I honestly don't know. I know Rebecca, I believe, is also a nurse. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm I'm probably not going to be the one to help you with that. But I will think, and if I can think of somebody, I will let you know. Allison, off topic, any chance at a second fantasy football league? Um, sure, I can't put it together and run it. I am like maxed out on the ones that I actually commission and run. And I don't want to mess anything up or miss something. But if one of you guys want to run it and you want to send me an invite, send me an invite. Maybe John or Jeff or my, myself or Pete or somebody else can run the team or draft the team with me to give it a little different spin than um, the league that we're doing um, already. So yeah, I would be I would be in if one of you guys starts one for sure. Okay, so let's let's discuss here what could fit into these different categories. So first is a biased grand jury. Now, there are two ways. There are explicit and implicit biases. And implicit bias has had much more of a push these days, especially in jurors and presentations and um, legal uh, seminars. We've talked about implicit bias and how you can try to pull that out and try to figure out which jurors may have it and be bad for your client or good for your client or whatever it may be. 
So when we talk about this, filing a motion that says the jury was biased, that can either mean it was so obvious based on their job, based on their answers, based on their background, based on what they said about their family members, that they were biased. But to try to use implicit bias in this type of a situation, I think would be very, very difficult. Because then usually you may have to say some things that you might not be 100% sure of to say this person has an implicit bias. Because by definition, implicit bias is usually not something they're explicitly saying or letting it on to, right? So I would think that they have at least something in the grand jury transcript that a juror said that would make them at least arguably biased. Now, this would be more akin to somebody that should have been struck for cause. It has to be very obvious that they should not have been put on this jury and they were. So I think that one's going to be tough to prove. Number two, inadmissible evidence. Now, the rules of evidence are different in a grand jury and the judge usually can step in if there really is something inadmissible or horrible going on. And inadmissible evidence is different than presenting evidence in an, in, in an inadmissible way. So they were saying they put evidence in that should not have come in. Now, I believe, and this is just a pure guess because we don't know what the answer is, I believe they could be referencing the DNA here. They could be saying the state has not provided enough to prove the reliability of the DNA, yet they put it before this jury. And if you remember back to the probable cause affidavit, they said we have probable cause even without the DNA. But if they're just using something that we know they're fighting about and arguing about, and trying to get to the bottom of, and they think that they may have um, gone around or circumvented some of the rules or used things they shouldn't have used in the process of processing the DNA, that could be inadmissible evidence. Now, of course, inadmissible evidence could just be them making up stories of testimony that didn't happen or some of these other crazy theories, of course. But from my perspective, that's the first thing that popped into my mind is something like that that they've argued about. Now, we don't know about a lot of evidence in this case. So they could be arguing about something we really just don't even know about yet because of the sealed documents and a lot of the things that have not been made public yet. And the gag order and things like that. All right. Next, lack of sufficient evidence. So this could be a re-argument of the burdens of proof. Like they had sufficient evidence to clear the probable cause burden, but not sufficient evidence to clear the beyond a reasonable doubt burden. That, that would be in, uh, inefficient or what was it? Insufficient lack of sufficient evidence. That's what that would be is not enough evidence. So inadmissible evidence is evidence that should have never come in regardless, but lack of sufficient evidence means even all the evidence that came in, it was not enough. And that usually attaches to a burden of proof. And then prosecutorial misconduct by withholding exculpatory evidence. And I'm not even going to try to guess what this is because I don't know what it is. But what I will say is this defense team has not been shy about putting the words exculpatory evidence in so many public documents. They know the actual memorandum of law or memorandum of facts in this case is going to be sealed. But they know what also is not going to be sealed, which is this motion that has the titles of some of their issues. And it doesn't list 24 things. It lists kind of bigger buckets that multiple issues and basis for this motion to dismiss is going to be public. So they say that the state did not present exculpatory evidence. There's multiple ways this can be a problem. Hiding something, um, misstating something purposely, uh, disregarding something. But 
the way that they do it could have something to do with whether or not it was prosecutorial misconduct. But to me, I think the defense wanted to put the words exculpatory evidence in another motion for the public to see because I've got to be honest. Both of these teams, state and defense, have seemed like they want the gag order. They don't want the cameras. But both of them, to me, have also seemingly said stuff and done stuff knowing there are cameras and the public's eye on this case. And just in case you think I'm just doing it to the defense, which I think most of you won't because I think most of you think I'm defense friendly, the state also did it in the motion hearing when instead of just having the hearing or filing a written document, uh, Thompson stood up and said, whoa, 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 the only reason the FBI went to Vargas's house was not witness intimidation was just because she recanted and they wanted to get her statement. And he felt like he needed to explain that in front of the cameras after Ann Taylor said in front of the cameras, the FBI showed up to my witness's house last night. We can't be having that. So I think both sides are doing certain things knowing that they are in front of the cameras. Let's get to a couple more questions. Yeah, 5,000 people here again. You guys are awesome showing up and showing out for the lives. Hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe. I love to see the community grow. Gingy Probs, joined late. Hey, all my question. Do we know next appearance for this and or Treviso? Can't stop thinking about HIPAA, LOL. Y'all have a great weekend. I don't know the answer for Treviso. I believe the next time they're meeting on the Coburger case is going to be September 1st. And I believe that's when they're going to hear this motion to dismiss and the prior motion to dismiss, as well as uh, motions for the cameras and things in the courtroom. It's either September 1st or September 8th. They had those two dates. I believe it's September 1st. So that's going to be coming up very soon. I don't know about Chorizo. Jeep in this. Speedy trial should be held against the prosecution only. Defendant shouldn't have to rush. The prosecution is more uh, ready from the jump. You know, that's an interesting thought. What if the prosecution had six months to get everything they were planning on using to the defense? All of their evidence, all of their witnesses, all of their experts, they had to give it to the defense. And then the defense has six months to prepare their case. And then we can give each side another month for rebuttal and things as they prep for trial. And then that turns the speedy trial rule into basically a year. So all these cases get, get held within a year, but you're right. The prosecution already had as much time as they want to prepare this case. The defense starts behind the eight ball. That's why I say a lot of times, it's not that I like every criminal defendant. I just say the, pro the process is set up to make the, the entire system much more difficult on criminal defendants than it does on prosecutors. Coming from somebody who has tried cases on both sides of the aisle, my dad as well, JD as well. Lots of lawyers in my firm have tried cases and represented the people of the state and represented criminal defendants. Deb, your invite link is in the chat. Okay. John, can you save that link? Hopefully, hopefully you can find it. If not, post it again, somebody. Tracy, thank you for the super chat. Rebecca, defense is throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. That being said, innocent until proven guilty. Nobody should be disparaged against here. I agree. And I think that the way we should look at this, in my opinion, I don't like telling people how to think, but using a or taking your, your lawyer's advice and doing something, a legal procedure that is afforded to you, like waiving speedy trial, or even going to trial. A lot of people think only guilty people go to trial. It's like, well, how else are you going to prove you didn't do it unless you go to trial? Or only innocent people go to trial. It's like, well, that's not true because lots of cases, the worst of the worst cases go to trial because your offer is life in prison or life in prison or the death penalty or the death penalty. We're not making any deals. So legal procedures and decisions, especially at, with the advice of counsel, should not be held to prove somebody is more or less guilty or innocent. The facts of the case that come out at trial really should be all that proves whether or not somebody did the crime they're charged with. Gingy Probs, the state is in its exculpatory evidence era. How do you feel Ann Taylor is doing? I think she's doing a good job. You know what's interesting? So, and I don't, oh man, I already X'd out of it. So if you look at some of the, and, and I just noticed this um, when I was reading this today, but if you look at the 
you know, the history on beyond a reasonable doubt versus probable cause. Now, I'm sure Ann Taylor has something to do with it. I'm sure she's approved it, whatever it may be. But a lot of those are written by Jay Logsdon. Um, and the stuff I just been like, eh. So a lot of that hasn't even been Ann Taylor, but I think she's done a good job. I don't think she's one of these lawyers that's trying to play like, oh, waving her hands, slamming things on the table, trying to really play it up for the cameras. I think there are some things strategically that she does knowing the cameras are there and the public eye is on it. Um, but, oh, okay. So, so yeah, but I, but I do think she's doing a good job overall. I would absolutely be giving her a high grade so far. We'll see how the trial goes. So I did want to, I did want to mention something else. So we have a brand new short posting today. That's a fun one. Um, it is a like one minute day in the life of working at a firm with my dad. And it's pretty funny and you get to meet some more of my family members in it. If you want to check it out, as soon as it's posted on our short page, we're supposed to already have the link, but I guess it is not posted yet. As soon as, um, as soon as that is uploaded, we will share the link here. Uh, Daria said, it sounds like you said chorizo, not Trevizo. Very cute. Is it, it's Trevizio, Trevizio, Trevizo, Chorizo. Not sure. You guys know how I mess that stuff up all the time. Uh, Tara, what is the precedent on handling a witness problem that just occurred? Handling a witness problem that just occurred. I'm not positive what you mean, but if you mean sending the FBI out to their house that same night, usually that is not the proper um, way to handle an issue with a witness. Um, the, the most natural way would be to call her back into court and say, we heard your recanting part. Is that true? Is that false? Or even bring her into the state attorney's office whatever it may be, but usually sending FBI agents is unusual. It is not the, the normal way to handle it, but also nothing illegal about it. You can send investigators or FBI agents to follow up with a witness statement and take their statement. There's nothing wrong with it. Just seems a little, a little weird. Bodie, do you pay your non-lawyer family? All of the ones that are in this video, the answer is yes, because they work at the office. We have three or four people in my family or extended family that work in the office. Question, is it odd for Ann Taylor to bring up the second phase already? Is that normal? Couldn't that give the impression he's guilty? So I get why people would think that, but the reason she's bringing it up, and again, we all got to see this together. So even if you're not a lawyer, even if you haven't um, experienced this, the Nicholas Cruz Parkland trial, the entirety of that trial was just phase two. So it can be a trial in itself. It is a second trial. It is a completely second job. It's like having two cases, not one, when you have that second phase. So saying she's prepping for this trial, for phase one, does that mean that she knows it's going to go to trial? Or does that mean she knows he's guilty or not guilty? No. She just knows that that is something she has to prepare for. The case could resolve. He could plea. Just like it might not ever get to a second phase. It doesn't mean she's not going to be prepared for it when they start trial day one, because as Mr. Thompson said, they're going straight into the second um, phase. Mitchell, do you think they're hiding evidence? I would say no. I do not think they're hiding evidence. I do think they're holding um, everybody to the rules, and if they don't think something is discoverable, then they're not going to turn it over. I wouldn't consider that hiding evidence. Um, do I think sometimes they go overboard with that? Yes, but if they're ordered to turn it over, I think that they will. Capelli, welcome to the membership crew. Um, blessed mom from Texas, my email, lawyer, you know, at gmail.com, send the invite there. And um, if you're talking about for the fantasy league, I don't know why I just assumed that. If you're not, you can send whatever email you need to at lawyer, you know, at gmail.com. Um, like I said, a lot of people have reached out, gotten in contact with me from here. And I absolutely love it. If you ever call or reach out from here, let me know that you follow us here and you're in the live chats and you watch our videos. Um, or even if you're in the rewatch, love to hear it and talk to you guys whenever you have injury cases, wrongful death cases, um, car accidents, premises, liability cases, negligent security cases, whatever it may be. 
when you call on those injury cases and I can help you out or somebody you know out in a difficult situation, I love hearing that we've already gotten a vibe here um, together in these videos. Uh, Sleuthy Goosey has a question here. Uh, do you think the FBI is not providing them things they need to turn over? They've basically said as much. Will there be any repercussions on the state for not complying when the FBI won't give it to them? So loaded question here. Number one, yes, I think that the FBI is not providing certain things. I don't know. They need to turn over, arguably. I will say that they, that is arguably discoverable. Yes, and this happens all the time, especially in federal trials where the FBI is handling the investigation in full. Number two, what will the repercussions be? We have gotten a case literally thrown out when we proved the FBI did this and destroyed a piece of evidence after we won an appeal and during a trial, the court, it was a federal judge though, which they sometimes act a little different. They're appointed for life, um, threw the case out. That was the repercussion. Now, there's no real sanction or repercussion for the state attorney if they asked for it and weren't given it. If they found, if the court found that they were involved, like, hey, don't give me this, or I'm not even going to ask you for this, or, you know, some text message or email, then absolutely they could be sanctioned. They could be disbarred potentially if they're doing things like this in a criminal case. I don't know that we have that in this case, but I definitely think the FBI has some stuff they haven't turned over. And I think the FBI disregards court orders from time to time. Not always. There's some really good FBI agents. And a lot of times they turn over all the evidence and everything they have in the case. But from time to time, and we've had experience with it, the FBI does do things like that. And they are above the law, so they feel, law enforcement officers generally sometimes feel like they're above the law. State attorneys, I mean, they're criminal defense attorneys, right? Prosecutors, we saw Murdoch, obviously thought he was above the law. So there are people in the legal field that absolutely think they're above the law. If I were guilty of a crime, I'd hire JL, he's slimy. Rebecca, can't wait for fantasy. Go Cowboys, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thanks for all you do, Peter. Best chat ever, hit that like button. I will second that this is, in fact, the best chat ever. And we will probably, oh, Norja said, I haven't missed a single one of your videos, just so you know. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, okay, so with that, I am going to take off and wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, I hope you get to enjoy it, get to relax. Those of you who work on the weekends, I hope you're super productive. I am hoping to relax a little bit. Um, and I appreciate you guys so much for coming here, for keeping it light, for keeping the questions coming, keeping the content growing, uh, hit that like button. If you haven't already tell your friends to subscribe, if they watch this stuff, follow us on all social media lawyer, you know, or Tragos law, you know, the bit of where to find us, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all that stuff. Check out lawyer, you know, in shorts. Unfortunately, I didn't get the link in time, um, from the people putting that up, but we will post it on our YouTube community page, but subscribe to that channel. If you haven't already. Um, we're trying to build that up, have some fun, do some more entertaining, some behind the scenes thing, introducing my family a little bit more. Um, and Pete and the, everybody else here at the firm, get to know them a little bit better than you do already. So please check that one out. Um, and then today, Friday, our podcast dropped on our podcast channel. It should be easy to subscribe to the three channels. They're all connected. Um, and it's in the lawyer, you know, if you go to the channels tab to make it easy. So it's not like you have to subscribe to a million things. And if you don't want to, I get it as well. I still appreciate you. All right. I'm out of here. Till next time, you guys have a good weekend. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know. So a little encore here because Netwoman said she received two Lawyer You Know hoodies, a black one, for my boyfriend, so he will stop wearing mine and the green one to wear with my camouflage leggings. Love them. Funny you said this, and I had to bring this up and mention it. So my wife has stolen 
multiple lawyer, you know, t-shirts of mine. Cause they're a little bit longer and they're incredibly comfortable. Like I'm surprised at how good the quality is. I don't make them myself. So it's not like I'm patting myself on the back, but, and she also does the same thing. Where's the big t-shirt with the leggings. Um, so I thought that was funny and wanted to point that out. Okay. Now I'm gone for real. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'm out of here.